We'll take it away from here. Good morning, everybody. Am I on? We got a new mic, so how is it? We good? Sort of? All right. Well, so I just, w one thing. We, we all know that maple syrup doesn't come from Delaware Park. It comes from Iowa cornfields, right? <laughs> right? No? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's too on the nose? Yeah. Uh, that reminded me of a story, but I won't tell it because it has nothing to do with what we're here for this morning. But it was a funny story. Uh, so we, um, I, I want to start just by asking the question, what, what, is, what does a meaningful life look like? And uh, this is rhetorical, so don't answer <laughs> or, or answer in your head. But what does a meaningful life look like? Uh, because we're going we're gonna to dig into that a little bit in our passage this morning. And uh, I, I also thought of um, one, of the, uh, one of the figures throughout history that I think highlights a Christian answer to the question, what is a meaningful life, is uh, how many of you guys are familiar with St. Ignatius, with his life story? A few of you, right? He founded the Jesuits. And um, he's an interesting figure, if you know anything about his biography. He, um, he had a very powerful vision for his life at a young age. He wanted to be an adventurer and a warrior, um, and by all accounts, he was that, right? This is what he was. And, um, but he ended up having a very powerful encounter with Jesus, that set his life on a very different direction, and he ended up becoming the founder of the Jesuits. So instead of becoming an adventurer and a warrior in the literal sense, he, he still was an adventurer and a warrior, but in, in a spiritual sense, and founded one of the you know, most powerful and long-lasting kind of Christian missionary movements that, that we've seen. Um, we'll come back to his story, but again, I, I think what, what he learned in encountering God is that the path to a meaningful life was not a path of um, looking deep into your own heart and finding the, the dreams and the passions that are there and then going and pursuing them, but rather the path to a meaningful life is by looking into the face and the heart of God and discovering the dreams that he has for your life and the purpose that he has for you and the world and pursuing that. And I think that that's, that's a challenge. Right? That's a challenge because, well, first of all, we live in a culture and a day and an age that says the worst sin you can commit is to not follow your, your heart, right? I mean, that, there, there are companies that literally advertise with slogans that say that, right? Uh, so we live in a culture that really teaches us that we should be true to ourselves, find what is inside of us, and bring it out into the world, and that is the truest form of, of a meaningful life. And, and the Christian message and the passage that we're going to get into this morning actually teaches that we are called to a life of obedience. And obedience is not a fun word, right? I think we're, we're in the middle of, of the Lenten season. And so, you know, part of, part of the Lenten season is, is accepting the limitations of life and the limitations of what it means to be a human being in need of salvation. And so I think, you know, wrestling with this call to obedience is probably appropriate for this season, right? Uh, but again, I want to frame this not as a call to the most meaningless life possible because it's a life of obedience, but actually this is a call to the most meaningful life possible because it's a call to obedience, right? So while it's hard, while obedience is probably never something we would think of as on our list of top 10 things we want to accomplish for our day. It's actually the path to, uh, well, to deep joy and to meaning and significance in our lives. Fair enough? All right, so we're going we're gonna to read. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 12, and we're reading verse 35 through, I think, 48, 49. So if you guys want to turn there, you can. I read out of the NIV. Um, you're welcome to just listen along if you want as well. So Jesus is talking here, and he says to the group of people listening, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. 
It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour when he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. That's good news, I guess. (laughs) From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. All right, so that's our text this morning, right? We ended, we ended on a strong note of warning, uh, <laughs> um, right? Um, so there's a few things in this passage, just to, and again, Jesus is talking in parables, and I think it is important, uh, it's important when we engage with Jesus' parables to understand what a parable is, right? So we don't necessarily need to take this story and, um, what, so for example, the, 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 the warnings and the rewards, the punishments and the rewards that are like built into this parable um, are not necessarily something we need to think about as, oh, well, God is going to punish me or reward me if I get this right or get this wrong. Like that's not exactly what Jesus is trying to say with this parable, right? Uh, and we're going we're gonna to get into what I think are the, the main points of, a par- of this parable. But a parable is something that Jesus is using a story to kind of like teach a lesson, right? And so it's, it's important not to like read into every little detail necessarily, but to really understand why is he, why is he giving this to us? Why is he teaching it or to us? Why, what's the point of this story? Does that make sense? And so I think the, the, the biggest things to pull out of this, the, these parables that Jesus is teaching here is that first he is telling us or telling his disciples to be ready, to be prepared, to be ready and prepared to serve, right? That's, that's kind of like the big point that he's, he's communicating is we should be ready and prepared to do what God wants us to do, right? That's the big point. Uh, he also, so that's, there's this like first chunk where he's talking about the servants who are waiting for their master to return from a wedding, right? And so again, you, you could imagine if you were the servants in, in that situation, right? This is your job. Your, your master has said, hey, I'm, I'm going away. I'll be back late. Make sure that you have everything ready for when I return. Um, and so you're, that's your job, right? That's what you get paid to do. Just like any of you have jobs and you get paid whatever it is you get paid to do, teach a class or, you know, build a wall or whatever it is, and your boss walks away and comes back and is expecting to see progress, right? And so that's what Jesus is pointing at in this parable, right? Is that, okay, so there are servants, they have a role to play, they have a job to do, and so they need to be actively doing it. They need to be prepared and waiting for when their master returns, right? So that's, that's like this first part of this passage. The second part, then he, he kind of like changes the metaphor of the parable a little bit. Then he starts talking about the, the master of the house, uh, if he knew when the thief was gonna come, he wouldn't be surprised by the thief and the, the thief wouldn't be able to come in and, and break in and steal anything, right? And so this is like, so Jesus is saying, be prepared, be engaged, be ready, but also be vigilant, right? That, that this isn't just about, um, you know, 
having the, having the tools ready to go. This is about like being watchful, being, as a matter of fact, back to uh, Ignatius's, um, uh, the, the Jesuit tradition. One of the things that uh, the Jesuits will talk about is that the posture of the Christian, the, they'll, they'll talk about the posture of the Christian being like standing on one foot with the other foot ready, ready to, to step. And that that's like the appropriate posture of a Christian or of a Jesuit, but I, I would argue of all Christians, is that we're in this place of like anticipation that God is about to call us in some direction and we're ready to move at all times. And that is what I think Jesus is pointing at in this passage, right? It's not just, you know, preparation. It's preparation and it's vigilance. It's like looking for the opportunity, waiting for what um, what is about to happen to happen so that we can jump into it, right? So again, Jesus points at these servants waiting for their master to return late at night, and he talks about, you know, uh, an owner of a house being on the lookout for somebody coming to break in and steal. And then Peter asks this question, and Jesus responds with yet a third parable or a third example. Um, And this time he talks about a servant who has been given a charge and the master leaves and kind of talks about two different ways that this, this servant could respond, right? Could respond with obedience or with disobedience. And uh, then that's where, that's where we get the punishments and the rewards, right? That, you know, if, if, the, if the, the servant does a good job and does what the master asks and is faithful, then when the master returns, he'll give him more responsibilities. He'll give him greater authority, Probably give him more pay or how, however that worked in, in those days, right? But give him, give him more accolades. Or if he comes back and finds that the guy has been, you know, he says if he was trying but, but failing, he's probably going to get a demotion. But if he was not only failing but was failing on purpose, it says he's going to get cut to pieces, right? So that's not good. I don't know. If, if, you, if you're... Spoiler alert, bad, bad ending to the story. So, so we've got these like three kind of like parables here, right? Or three different, different examples. The first, Jesus is, is essentially saying, be prepared, be ready. And then he's saying, be vigilant, be on the lookout, right? And then he's saying, be obedient, right? Be doing the work of God. Be obey, obedient and obeying the will of God in your life. And this is the point of this passage, right? But I think this is where no child and definitely no adult will respond well to a call to obedience simply for the sake of obedience, right? Do it because I said so doesn't really work very well doesn't work with your own kids very well. It'll, it'll work until they reach a certain age, and then it won't work at all. And it definitely doesn't work with adults, right? And so I actually don't think that this is what God's message is to his church, is do what I said because I said so. I don't think that that's it at all. And I think that the, the fact that Jesus is pointing at rewards and punishments in these parables is actually part of how we can understand that God isn't just saying to us, do what I said because I said so, right? And it's not do what I said or else. It's really more like this is the path to the life that you want, right? This is the path to a good and meaningful life is the, the, the path of obeying God. And again, I think in keeping with the Lent season, that is a hard word. That is a difficult thing because we don't want to obey, right? It's not, it's never easy to obey. It's always something that is hard. Somebody is telling us to do something that we don't want to do or wouldn't do on our own and we have to submit our will to theirs, ultimately submit our will to God's. My wife is smirking at me. I'm going to ask her about that afterward. Are there, are there specific situations where I needed to be more submissive, honey, that you're thinking of? <laughs> oh, you do? My wife likes obedience. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe. Uh, no, that, that's, that's fair enough. So, uh, you know, the little autobiography, right? I think my besetting sin all the way up until my early 20s was rebellion, right? And that's probably not true of everybody in the room. But I think even... Um, 
I think there are people who will hide in obedience, I think is maybe what you're talking about. Um, but, I mean, Jesus even tells some, some parables about that, you know, the parable of the talents. It's kind of like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm expecting you to engage here. I'm expecting you to actually be, um, like, to, to step out and to take risks. I mean, that's even part of what your, your, your God story was about this morning. And I think even in that, there is this call to be people who are God's people and to be people who are... Um, wrestling with what it looks like to really give our whole lives and our whole hearts to him all the time. And so whether we're people who are naturally rebellious and it's a real struggle to obey or who are naturally obedient and have to respond to God's call to step out and take risks and to do new things, I think in both of those, there's this call to be God's person, right? And that I think that is a challenge, regardless of how we're wired, to say, again, it's not about me looking into my own heart and d- deciding what dream I have for my own life. It's about me asking God, God, what is the dream that you have for me? What is the life that you're calling me to live? And so, again, you know, back, back to Ignatius' life story. This is a guy who, in, in, in many ways, we wouldn't think of him as having a dream of a comfortable life. Right? He didn't dream of a, a life of creature comforts. He wanted to go to fight in wars and, and to have adventures. Right, And so this wasn't a life of self-centeredness in the sense that he wanted to like, you know, lay on a couch and be fed grapes all day long. This was a guy who wanted to throw himself into the teeth of danger. And yet, it was still a selfish life. Does that make sense? And so I think that selfishness can come in different forms for sure. But God is, you know, Jesus is pointing in this passage and God is calling us to a life that is a life of obedience that's shaped by God. And yet also I think it is a meaningful life that God is calling us to. So I was going to throw up some slides. I got got caught up. But um, so asking the question, what is it? What does it mean for us to then take, take that on seriously, to say we are going to be those people who are the servants who are prepared and vigilant and engaged and obedient in doing the master's work, right? And uh, so the first, this is a you know, picture of a teacher teaching a class. I think God wants us to be people who have who have our intentions and our understanding and our, you know, our heart and our mind shaped by the truth of God's word and God's call in our life, right? That, that's what God wants us to be. That's, that's how this applies to our life. And I was thinking about um, just a couple of examples of what this looks like in real practical ways. And the first, the first thing that, that I remembered was um, the, the church that we were a part of. We got to visit this church this last, last Sunday. Um, in Redding, California, the church that we were a part of where we really first started serving Christ. There was a, a woman named Shelly who, um, she was like special needs and uh, was a part of this church. And she was a part of the church the whole five years. She was like one of the original members of the church. When there was three people in the church, Shelly joined the church. And what she did every Sunday, she sh- showed up and she made sure that there was hot coffee for everybody in the church. And she did that every Sunday. And it was one of those things, I mean, again, you've probably met people who've had that kind of a role in a church community and seen how meaningful that is, right? It's one of the, again, I haven't, she wasn't there. She's, I haven't seen her in 15 years, and yet I still remember her as this person who had a special role in our church community where she was contributing to the well-being of our church, right? She had found a way to, to serve. And like how special that was to me that it was special to her. Does that make sense? And then another thing that I was thinking about is, um, so uh, I, I don't even know who this person is, but I remember my mom and dad when they were talking about, um, they had made the decision to adopt. So my, me and my brother 
or their biological children. We left the house, um, went off to college, and my parents decided that they were going to adopt, and they ended up adopting my sister. But one of the stories that my, or one of the kind of the part of the way that my dad explained their decision is he had read some biography about this woman in history. Uh, obviously, she, she must have had a husband too, but it was specifically about this woman who was a Christian woman who had raised like seven or eight children who had all gone on to like change the world in some significant way. Right, and again, I don't remember. I don't remember who they were or what this woman's name was. I just remember that for my dad, he read this story of this woman who had changed the world through parenting kids, and he's like, "I'm going to do that." I think I, there's a lot of things in this world that I can't do, but I think I'm a, uh, um, I'm an okay dad, and you guys are gone, so we're just going to have more kids and raise them. And again, like that's there, there's something in that that I think is tied to what we're talking about here in this passage, right? That these are people in my father, in this woman who inspired him, in Shelly, who was a part of our church, who had found a way to identify some sense of purpose for their lives that was found in serving other people as a part of God's community or God's plan for our world. Does that make sense, right? And again, that's not the message that we get from our culture. If you want to have the best life possible, here's all of the material things that you can consume, or here's all of the wonderful experiences that you can have, or here's all of the rights that you enjoy. That's how you have a meaningful life according to our culture. And I think if you've tried any of those things for very long, you'll realize they don't really lead, it's a vacuous, empty life. The life of consuming all of our rights as Americans is not the path to a meaningful life. Again, I appreciate the rights that I have as a citizen of America in the 21st century, but the meaning in my life is actually found in, you know, binding myself to another human being for 20 years and figuring out how to love each other. Making some more kids and then figuring out how to like raise these humans for 20 years. Being a pastor in a church and doing ministry, right? These are the things that I've found tremendously meaningful and have produced so much joy in my life. And those are also the things that have been, the, those are the three hardest things I've ever done in my life, <laughs> right? Is be a husband, be a dad, and be a pastor. All three of those things have cost me everything. And yet they're the things that have given me everything too, right? That's the path to a, a meaningful life. And that's what Jesus is pointing at. Serve God and you will have the best, it will, yeah, you're going to have to, Die to self, be obedient to somebody else's will, and you'll have the best life you could ever imagine. Hard, difficult, but better than what you could have imagined. So the next slide. Um, again, right? So picture of a, a classroom. This is a you know picture of a guy. Man, it's funny. So I, I, I looked up tool belts, right? Because I had to find a picture of a tool belt. And just some of the pictures that, first of all, like half of them were of like scantily clad women in tool belts. It's like, how, how did that happen? And then also like, it was like all of these men wearing like children's tool belts too. It was like just really weird. It took me, it took me like 20 minutes to find that picture. Sorry, just <laughs> throw that out there. It was crazy, right? You would think you would search for tool belts uh, on the internet and you would get a picture of tool belts. No. <laughs> It was a moral hazard trying to find that picture. <laughs> All right. But so the point is, again, what does it look like for us to be prepared or equipped or, or engaged in the work of God in the world, right? And also, so just like it's, it's about shaping our, our mind or our heart or our intentions about, you know, figuring out, okay, well, what does it look like for me to serve God? I think there's also this question of like, all right, well, what are the tools that we need to do this work. And um, the tools of the Christian, I would say, historically, have we, we as Christians have always said that there are three primary tools that you need to be a good, good Christian, right? Can you, can you guys name them? What are, the, what are the tools? What? Oh, I like that. That's a good one. You got to be fat. I'll, I'll just, this, this, it's, it's not a trick question. I'll just answer the question so I don't, so I don't make you feel bad. But so, so the first is the Bible, right? This is, this is one of our tools. This is one of the tools. The word of God is one of our tools, right? The, um, the, the author of the book of Hebrews says, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
right? And so the word of God is something that we turn to again and again and again as a tool for all sorts of things, for informing us, but also for empowering us, for instructing us, for, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, man, I can't tell you how many times somebody has spoken a word of scripture over me in ways that have changed the trajectory of my day, my week, my month, or even my life, right? And, and, and vice versa, how many opportunities I've had to share a passage of scripture with somebody where I didn't have the words to say and God did and those words were powerful and they shaped that person in, in the way that God wanted to speak to them, right? And so this is, this, is pow- this is a powerful tool at our disposal. The second thing that I would point to is the spirit of God himself, right? And again, how many times have you been in situations where it was, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know what to do, or, or I know it needs to be done, but I, I can't do it. Like, this is beyond my ability to accomplish something. God, would you show up? Oh, God shows up. Wow, <laughs> it's done. Again, th- this is something that I have encountered over and over and over again in my life as a Christian, where what we need or what I need in the moment is for God to show up by his spirit and to do something, whether it's in my heart or in a relationship with somebody or to speak something to somebody or to reveal something. And it's, and and so again, this is, I mean, obviously it's weird to talk about God as one of our tools, but in a very real sense, scripture points at the spirit of God as this this tool at our disposal for being empowered to do the things that God has called us to do, for directing us into those things, for allowing us to experience the comfort and the presence of God, it's all by his spirit, right? And then the third thing that I would point out and say again of the three tools that are at our disposal is the church, is the community of God's people, right? And again, how many times have I been in a situation where I have needed something and it's come to me from one of you? Or vice versa, where I have been that person who has been able to step in and to offer to somebody something that they need, right? And so when we talk, you know, like a carpenter needs a tape measure and a hammer and a saw, a Christian needs the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and a community of believers to belong to, right? These are the tools at our disposal to be the people that God has called us to be, to be prepared and engaged and vigilant and obedient to, to God. And um, yeah, just one of the things that I was thinking about is um, how, uh, so one of the things that Tammy and I get to do is hang out with married couples or even with, you know, people who are going to get married, like premarital counseling or you know, meet with, meet with couples that are like struggling in some area or something like that, or sometimes just hang out with couples and just have fun too. But, but and we, we have, it, there's a lot of meaning and joy in that for us to be able to do that. And I think one of the things that comes out of that is we, we often laugh about the fact that, you know, you'll, you'll hang out with somebody, maybe uh, somebody who's been married for a year or two, and they're starting to like realize that they actually married another human being and it's going to be difficult (laughs) is that most of the time what people need in that situation is for somebody who's a few steps ahead of them to say, yeah, that really is hard. Human beings are kind of crazy and you married one. This is also pretty normal. Well, let me tell you what it's like for us. Ha ha ha. Isn't that funny, right? Like that's literally kind of like what happens is is that... (laughs) You, you just need a little bit of perspective, right? You're a year into this thing, and yeah, like this person isn't you, and they don't think like you, and that's difficult. But having somebody say, yeah, like that is hard. It's also kind of funny, and like it's really normal, and let's laugh about it together. And part of the reason why we've been able to do that is because we've had people in our lives who have done that for us, right? We've been those young married couple that needed somebody to come alongside us and say, yeah, I know, Steve's crazy or Tammy's crazy, but let me tell you about my husband or my wife. And yeah, like these are just normal problems that people have to work through in marriage. It's, you know, it's it's weird to communicate with somebody that 
doesn't think like you, but it's okay. And let's laugh about it and let's pray about it. And you're going you're gonna to make it through this. And so we've had, even some of you in this church have been those older married couples to us to just kind of listen to our troubles and pray for us and laugh about it and encourage us. And then in turn, we've been able to do the same thing, right? And so the community of God's people is itself something that we have at our disposal to encourage us. And again, that, like, that's something that is incredibly meaningful for us to do, to be a part of, you know, serving other people in that way. Does that make sense, right? And so again, the path to a meaningful life is not a life where we serve ourselves, but really a life where we serve others. Another slide here. Uh, what, it, what it looks like to be prepared, right? Um, so if you're going to, you know, be an athlete, you got to lift weights. Um, if you're going to be a Christian, we have to train our souls, right? There, there is still training that goes on. Um, the, when did I, where did I put that? Right, from Timothy. Train yourself to be godly for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Again, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, right? And so this is what, you know, we would talk about the spiritual disciplines, right? Spending time in prayer, spending time at worship, spending time fasting, spending time feasting, spending time in fellowship, spending time in solitude, right? These are the the things that Christians and even you know, even before the, the Christian church, the, the Jewish tradition, right? These are practices that people of faith have engaged in for centuries, for millennia, as ways of shaping and forming who we are on the inside so that we can then be the people that God wants us to be. We can live lives of obedience. I'm, I, I would imagine you've all been in situations where you've responded inappropriately and wish you would have responded a different way. You've probably all been in situations where you've responded appropriately and felt, you know, almost like a little, little proud of yourself, right? Or you've probably, so one of the, one of the, it's just a simple thing, but some of you guys know John Lee, a friend of mine. He's a business person. I'm a pastor, right? Or he's a retired business person. And yet, so many, so I hang out with him a lot. He's a friend and kind of a co-conspirator on lots of little projects. And so many times I'm, I'm hanging out with him and we're talking about some sort of a project together. And I, the pastor, am caught up in the, the, the work to be done. And John, the business guy, says, you know what? Can we stop and pray? And it's just something I really appreciate. And he doesn't pray long, eloquent prayers. He doesn't pray pastor prayers. He prays business guy prayers. But he does that all the time. He's always the guy who's like, hey, we need to pray about this. And I just appreciate that that's the way his heart has been trained over the years, that that is a habit of his soul, that when he is engaged in work that he thinks is important and matters to God, he wants to step back all the time and just say, hey, God, you need to bless this or it's not going to work. You need to direct it or we're going to screw it up. And it's something that I appreciate, right? And so that's, that too is a part of what it means for us to be people who are prepared and vigilant to be obedient to the will of God in our lives. Next slide. So this is where, man, I love this picture. You got to take it in for a second. Whoa. Right? Yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's a cool picture. This, like, this resonates with me on so many levels, I can't even tell you. So first of all, I was that kid who was like, please get me out of here. <laughs> I'm still that kid. Um, Right, so just, just to clarify, right, you've got the teacher and all of the students are kind of like in muted colors, like gray, gray shades, and then you've got out the window is like the glorious creation <laughs> that's in full color, and then the one kid who's like ignoring what's going on in the class and staring out the window is in color, right? Anyway, I, I think that's a great picture um, for a lot of reasons. But also, like it just highlights... A call to an obedient life, I think, is something that, you know, you guys wouldn't be in this room if you hadn't in some way, shape, or form said yes to that call to an obedient life, right? Yeah, I want, I want to obey God with my life. And so while there is a decision that all of us have to make, will I serve Jesus or will I serve myself? The reality is, is that for most of us, 
it's not the big decision of who will I serve with our life or who will I serve with my life that we have to make today. It's more like, okay, I've made the decision to serve Jesus, but then there's all these little decisions that I have to make throughout the course of my day in things that sometimes even seem insignificant at the time, and I have to choose in that moment to also be obedient, right? That's, that's the true um, place of decision, I think, for us. And so, you know, <laughs> whatever's going on here, right? Like, clearly this child has a decision to make, and maybe we could argue that she's making the right decision by ignoring the teacher and engaging with the world outside, or maybe we can argue that she's making the wrong decision by ignoring the teacher. But the, the, the point of the picture and the point that I'm trying to make is that you know, she's in the class, she's there, not, not necessarily because she wants to be, obviously, but it, like we can be present, we can have made the decision to say, I will serve Jesus with my life, I will be obedient, and yet that decision will crop up again and again and again, right? And so, you know, if you're in the room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus with your life, that decision is for you. But if you're in the room and you've made a decision to follow Jesus with your life, that decision is still in front of you and it will be in front of you all day, every day, right? And so, yeah, I, I think that begs the question because, you know, as my wise wife shared earlier, <laughs> we're all tempted in different ways. We're all wired differently, right? And so what are those temptations for you to, you know, if you're, if you're Ignatius of Loyola, you're tempted by dreams of glory and, you know, a glorious death on the battlefield. Probably most of you in the room aren't tempted by dreams of a glorious death on the battlefield. But what are you tempted by? Because I'm sure that we're all tempted by something. And so to, to be people who are resolute and saying, no, I, I actually believe that serving God with my life, a life of obedience is actually the best life, right? Jesus says, I came so that you could have life, abundant life, more life, better life. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that you could have life, abundant life, right? And th there's, again, this, the voice of the thief whispering, oh, you, you could have a glorious death on a battlefield or whatever, whatever that, that temptation is for you, and we have to be people who are saying, no, 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 I've chosen this path because it's the best path. It's the right path. It's the path that I'm on. So the last slide here, and this is where, um, that's a great picture. <laughs> this is where hopefully like we can maybe land the plane and the rubber hits the road for how this applies to us today. Uh, so this is a group of friends who are uh, exploring the inside of a, of a car probably at the time it was a new car. Um, and, I mean, in one sense, the point of this morning's message is that we would be people who are, you know, gaining the tools and shaping and preparing a, a life of purpose and, um, you know, being people who are engaged in spiritual disciplines, right? So, but that, I kind of basically just said, do all the things that Christians are supposed to do. So that's practical and also not very practical, right? So to give you something maybe a little bit more practical this morning to sit with, like looking under the hood and asking some questions about where, where things need to change or where things need to be worked on, right? That's something that we can do this morning is, all right, <laughs> what would it look like for me to be more prepared, more equipped, more vigilant, more obedient in my life? Where is a place that, you know, maybe my, my heart is not shaped in the way that I think God would want it to be shaped, where things don't come out of my mouth that I think would honor God, or maybe maybe it's a very different different thing. Maybe it's, you know, I don't necessarily have any real sense of purpose or vocation, and that's something that I really want to start just pressing into and discerning and asking for people to help me figure that out. Or, or maybe it's, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't really know the Bible very well, and I'd like to start getting more into it and understand. Again, it, it, it's going to be something different for everybody, but what if, if we were going to say, what is that next practical step that I need to take if I'm going to be somebody who really truly is living a life of obedience to God? What would it be? Right? What is that thing? 
So I'll put that in front of you um, just as we get ready to take communion as something for you to be talking to God about, right? And asking for his input into. Um, And uh, again, as we get ready to take communion, this this ritual, this, this symbolic meal that we eat, it, it literally is the physical declaration, I want to be God's person. That's what it is, right? That's what we're doing when we do this. That we together are engaged in this symbolic meal where we're saying we belong to each other, sure, yeah, that's why we do it together, but really what we're saying is my life belongs to you. That's what we're saying, right? And, and the symbolism of that is because this, like, this is the symbol of Jesus saying to us, my life belongs to you, right? That's what this is. Jesus takes the bread and the juice or the wine and says, this is my, my, my body and my blood and it's real food and drink for you. Take it. It's for you. And then we in return in eating that are saying, yeah, okay, we're receiving that because we are your people, right? And so this idea of, an obedient life, being a meaningful life, this, this call to a life where we are prepared and engaged and equipped and vigilant to serve God with our whole being. I mean, that's what the, this is a declaration that we're signing up for that. Does that make sense? So I'm going to invite you guys to come up uh, and take, you can take the bread and the juice or uh, we've got the, the prepackaged cups are gluten-free so you can take them and return to your seats and then I'll lead us in taking that together. But again, I just would encourage you to be talking to God or be reflecting on Um, the things that God has been saying to you this morning. So come on up. So I started this morning by talking about the story of Ignatius and um, the encounter that Ignatius had with God came, interestingly enough, uh, started on a battlefield where he was, he was actually shot in the leg by a cannonball and they didn't know if he was going to survive and he ended up um, on a bed for, I don't exactly remember how long, but something like a year where he was stuck in bed. And that was the place where God got a hold of him. <laughs> I mean, that'll, that'll get your attention, right? Um, but really, there, there's a lot more to the story. It's worth digging into. But, but the point is that God used that time to begin to allow Ignatius to look at his own dreams and his own life and also look at the, the dreams 
um, and the lives of people who had chosen to live for Jesus and to like kind of hold those two things side by side. And he realized that he was living the wrong life. That while he had a dream that he thought would fulfill him, he realized that wasn't the best dream that he could have for his life, even though it was the one that he came up with. And that God's dream for his life was much better. And so, you know, Ignatius models for us what it means to, you know, to look under the hood, to, to actually be somebody who is taking a real account of who we are. Uh, in Romans, Paul says, you know, for by, the grace, for, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you, right? That we would be people who have a real vision of who we are that comes from God, that's in accordance with the truth. And I think that can be hard. That can be difficult. It, it's necessary work though, right? That, that we would do that kind of work, that we would take a real honest stock of ourselves. But I think in coming to the communion table, we come to one of the, not one of, the most powerful truth in the universe, which is the most honest assessment of yourself, you know, looking in the mirror and really truly, truly seeing yourself for who you are, I think it leads a lot of us to probably like painful places, fearful places, shameful places. And yet when God looks at you, he loves you so much that he's willing to lay his life down for you, right? And that is what this is. It's this declaration that God sees it all. He knows who you are and he thinks of you as his most valuable and treasured possession. He loves you. And so as Christians, that like that's the central truth of our lives, of our faith, of what we believe is the central truth of the whole universe, right? And so that's what we're here to celebrate this morning more than anything else. So again, Jesus gathered his friends for a meal. He took the bread and he said, when he broke it and blessed it, this is my body, it's broken for you. Eat it and remember my death. And then he also took the, the wine and he told his friends, this wine is my blood. It's poured out for you, the blood of the new covenant. Take it and drink it. So why don't we stand? Bless you. <laughs> Two or three times. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I have to. I have to share an announcement. This is not normally how I, I like to share announcements, um, but I forgot. I forgot an announcement. Um, so first, if if God is doing something with you this morning, right? If God has put His finger on something, whether through worship or through the message or whatever it is, like just respond to that, right? There's people here that would love to pray with you or talk with you. If you don't know anybody here and you want to go talk to somebody else, do that. But just be be responsive to what the Spirit of God is doing in you this morning, okay? Uh, and then the announcement is, I, I'm pretty sure everybody's heard, but next Sunday we have a different start time to our worship service, which is at 10 a.m., right? Um, so just just one final, um, final reminder that that's happening next Sunday. Yes, for those of you who actually still have clocks that aren't attached to cell phones, yes, exactly. Make sure that you make sure that you change your clocks next Sunday too. So, so somebody told me that they're like, make sure to tell everybody that they have to change their clocks. I'm like, I haven't changed my clock since 2006 when I got a cell phone. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, again, if um, if if. If you are in a place where you need prayer, please don't leave without getting prayer. Let me pray for you now. God, thank you for my friends. Thank you that every person in this room I know has walked in in some way, shape, or form out of a desire to be obedient to you. That's why they're in this room. And so, God, I pray that you would take whatever, 
whatever they can offer, that you would take it, God. You would take what, however small the spark, the spark is, that you would breathe on that and turn it into a flame, that you would uh, prepare and equip your people for lives that glorify and honor you and also fill them with joy. And I pray that you would do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.